last fall, Rena, Katrina, Rebecca, Kirsten, Sashi, Nico, Alvara all gathered for a weekend in the New Economics Institute's library in the Berkshires to imagine a new kind of economics and the responsibility in creating it. This weekend's conference is a, an idea that was born at that gathering, further developed over the past four months with addition of new team members welcomed in and wonderfully implemented as we've seen this weekend. Won't you join me in saluting the conference organizers, their initiative, their follow through, and their example of graceful distributed leadership. Well, organizers. Very impressive. The title of the conference this weekend is Transition to a New Economy. What would a new economy look like? At its core, the economic is no more than that place where human labor, organized by human ingenuity, transforms the natural world into products for use by others. Human labor, organized by human ingenuity, transforming the natural world into products for use by others. That simple, that profound. That economic process can be life affirming or it can be degrading to those involved and to the planet itself. The task of the new economy, I'm sure we all agree, is to ensure it is life affirming at every level. Our strategy can be to tackle this degradation where we see it and work for system reform, or we can begin building new economic systems that reflect our highest hopes. Thank you, Neva, for that phrase. <laughs> both are necessary, both the reform and the building. In the Berkshires, we have focused on creating regional economics institutions that encourage local production for local needs and help shape the kind of life-affirming economy we would like to see. First, land. All production requires access to land and natural resources. However, it is not land and natural resources that create wealth or our wealth, but the transformation of those resources into products needed by others. Land and natural resources are the base, the given of an economic system, but are not themselves appropriate commodities. When land and natural resources are treated as commodities and traded on the market as in our current system, an imbalance occurs in the economic. A few people can profit from the need of all for access. No new wealth is generated in the trading of land, only a speculative value with all the consequences of that speculation. How instead should access to land and natural resources be allocated if not by the market in our new economy how do we deal with land? The Community Land Trust in the Southern Berkshires allocates land by social contract. A Community Land Trust is a nonprofit, regionally based, open membership organization with a board of directors elected from its members. 
Its goal is to acquire land by gift or purchase, develop a land use plan appropriate for each site that takes into consideration both the ecological characteristics of the site and the social need. It then leases those sites on a 99-year lease basis, giving security to the lessee, but not ownership. The lessee owns improvements on the land, the house, the barn, the fence, the well, but not the land itself. And at resale, the lessee offers back those improvements at current replacement value adjusted for deterioration, meaning the lessee benefits according to the rise in building costs, but not according to the rise in the speculative value of land. The community land was in the Southern Berkshires owns three tracts of land with a total of 24 homes kept permanently affordable for year-round residents. And it also owns Indian Line Farm, the first community-supported agriculture farm in this country. It means that a one-time investment by citizens in the Berkshires to purchase the land at Indian Line has maintained a permanent resource um, for agricultural production. The lease requires minimum crop production and organic methods. So that same approach can be used to secure land for community cannery or a solar energy site, or where's Kyle? Kyle, it, a community land can secure your dreams of um, a farm and a production center in Maine uh, so that you're not paying for the burden of the land debt, but the pr appropriate production on the land supports your activities. So uh, that CLT becomes a tool for the local community to do its own planning and land planning and allocation. What about money? What about money needed to finance production in these new economies, local economies? The issuing of currency is a powerful tool for communities to encourage and direct creation of new enterprises. In the 1800s and early 1900s, every commercial bank in this country issued their own currency. That meant there was capital available um, at the local level, run by local people knowing the resources of the region. The money was ideally placed in circulation at the point of making a productive loan, classic productive loan, issuing money to a farmer in the spring for seeds. That $500 loan results in $10,000 worth of new carrots and broccoli and tomatoes circulating in that economy in the fall. So it's a sound currency. A little bit of money supports a lot of production. The value of the currency stays strong. We gave up that distributed issuing of currency for the convenience of centralized issue in 1913 with the creation of the Federal Reserve. And there were good reasons for that. But no, we did not give up the right to issue regionally. That right still remains. And in the Berkshires, we've exercised that right by creating Berkshires issued not by a for-profit bank, but by a non-profit, regionally-based, democratically-structured organization accountable to and reflecting regional needs and regional values. Beautifully designed, see it here, um, honoring local heroes, featuring paintings by local artists. We have Robin Bennett, who started the CSA movement, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, who 
uh, the great social leader, uh, Orman the Berkshires, um, Herman Melville, and uh, our first peoples, native people to our region. Berkshires may be traded for federal dollars at any of 13 banks, branch banks in our region, five banks, 13 branches, 95 federal get you 100 Berkshires, which are then circulated at over um, 400 local businesses in our region of 19,000 people. Over 3.5 million Berkshires have gone out from the bank since we started in, nine, in 2006. The next stage, to begin issuing loans in Berkshires, thereby exercising the full power of a currency, creating money at the point of making loans and empowering our local community to be resilient Richard, thank you for that word. Resilient, um, able to bear the fluctuations in um, the global economy. But what of labor? Labor, too, has become a commodity. In reality, it's not labor that's exchanged in the economic process, but products of labor, the fruits of human labor transforming nature. We often think we're buying labor, not a reality. We're actually buying the products created by labor. And that sense of hiring labor turns worker into wage slaves and degrades. We need new forms such as the Mondragon system of worker co-ops in the Basque region of Spain, um, like the Cleveland project that Gar spoke about which are stellar examples of workers owning and selling the fruits of their labor rather than their labor itself, changing our economic relationships. So new forms of land labor capital in our new economy. <clears throat> when these relationships are set right, when labor is again dignified, when land is seen as a common resource for us to steward and use wisely, renewably, as the basis for production for future generations, when money is seen as the tool for financing new products rather than as a commodity in and of itself, when the scale of these institutions, new economic institutions, are tied to a particular community of place, promoting face-to-face -face transactions and responsibility in our economic lives consciousness, then we have the basis for a healthy regional economy. The healthy regional economy is intimately tied to a healthy <coughs> regional ecology, a thriving Sorry, a thriving regional culture, a diverse and independent regional society. And when independent regional economies around the world join together in trade, neither exploiting nor being exploited, then we have the basis for a healthy global economy. It can be done. It is in some ways our destiny in America to work with the economic, our element to move in and change or fail in the task. Gar Call asked of us for two decades of work to bring about this transformation. Perhaps it will be longer but a necessity. I remain grateful to the organizers of this event for taking up the challenge. Thank you.
Okay, I'll get to this in a minute. Um, I want a little history first. Since 1800, when there were one billion people alive on this planet, we have grown to seven million. In that period of time, the ability to provide for people comforts, amusements, uh, security in terms of food and other essentials, uh, education and health, the ability to provide that for people has grown to such an extraordinary degree that a much higher proportion of the people alive today can have what in 1800 would have been thought of as a life of luxury. So that is a great success story. And in brief, the explanation for how it came about was the growing use of natural resources, including inanimate forms of energy. Because as a worker has more energy and resources available, he or she becomes more productive. Uh, if you have a machine, you can produce more than you can with a hand tool. And the machine requires both natural resources and inanimate energy. So over the intervening period, the amounts of resources and energy were cons constantly growing in proportion to the inputs of labor. And labor was becoming more uh, productive, and therefore wages could grow, so that people could purchase the things that they needed much, much more than before. So that is the great story of the Industrial Revolution. And as Richard Heinberg pointed out, uh, we may be at an inflection point when the proportion of energy and resources to labor inputs is going to begin to decline again. Because with degrading quality of resources and ever harder to get to extract uh, fossil fuel energy, those things, their cost rises. And a cost minimizing, profit maximizing producer is going to use more of the less expensive input. And comparatively, labor is going to be increasingly cheaper than the other inputs. That means the wages of labor are going to go down. And I think it is quite a probable result. So what I have up here are three possible results. And the first one uh, suggests that labor inputs will increase. And they might increase absolutely if households feel that they need to maintain the standard of living that they've had. If they need to keep earning enough to be able to purchase as much as if they've been purchasing, then they're going to have to work more and more. And so you're going to have two earner house households with each one working two or more jobs, and so forth. That's not an attractive proposal. Uh, most people would really rather have less than the standard work day and more leisure time. So the second possibility is that, in fact, people don't work more. Supposing we hold the labor input constant, everybody works the same as now, but everybody is less productive because of less productive resources and more expensive energy so that the producer doesn't allow the worker to have as much of these to work with. Then wages go down, total household income goes down, consumption goes down. Uh, there are people who have been talking for quite some time about the possibility that all of that could happen without declining well-being. 
that we can rearrange our lives, we can rearrange our definition of what a good life is in ways that can make us comfortable with having more leisure time and less stuff. The third possibility, of course, is the one that the technological optimists talk about. And I used to work with Buckminster Fuller, who was certainly one of the leading technological optimists, and would talk about doing more with less. And up to a certain point, you can do that. We have seen, many of you here have probably seen charts that show how we could use conservation to solve half the gap between the amount of energy available and the amount that we want. So that is certainly doing more with less. But that's only half the gap. And then people have projected ways of, of closing the rest of the gap with solar energy and, and other renewables and so forth. Maybe technology will prevail. A friend of mine who used to work with me with Bucky has said, People don't want toothpaste, they want oral hygiene. And if you can find a way to provide that weightless, massless result, oral hygiene, without toothpaste, that's what people will want. And he is working with businesses to try to persuade them that that's what they have to invent. So the third option is not out of the question. But there are problems I want to bring up. OK, so technology is what's supposed to make the third option happen. But here we have a picture of technology trying to achieve that, trying to go on an upward curve, and declining resource quality, constantly batting it down. Uh, so that's one picture. Here's another picture of human capabilities. And you're going to see the same things. And I've got these dangerous red arrows that I call counter forces. <laughs> well, that is not so impersonal as it sounds, those counter forces. Most of all, I would say that the major counter force that we encounter is misinformation. There's a tremendous amount of misinformation in our society about what are the problems we face, what it would cost to uh, try to address them, and what possible solutions there might be, and the, the cost benefit of action now on climate change has been enormously skewed in a lot of uh, the reports. And people talking about you know, that the science of, of climate change is useless. The, a lot of that kind of thing. And then there's another type of misinformation, equally if not more important, which is the image of what is a good life, which is pervaded by all the media who depend on uh, producers to support those media. And so we have an image of a good life which depends on consuming a lot. And that is another of the things which I think is going to uh, counter to human capabilities. And it's tragic that uh, schools with declining budgets are accepting all kinds of advertisements in their schools. And they're allowing curricula to be written by the American Petroleum Company. Uh, um, American Petroleum Institute. Institute, thank you. Things like that. So those are the, among the counter forces. And now a more complicated one, which is really going to be a lead into what, to Michael Lipton's specialty, and he hasn't seen this. Oh, and I've got the wrong slide here, darn it. All right. So here we have both technology and human capabilities trying to move up. But it's, in ca it's countered by three things. And the, one of them is population growth. Because the point of this slide is that the human capabilities and the technology are trying to increase 
the nutritional inputs available per capita. And so population growth makes it harder to achieve that. You've got more people to feed. Second, I put demand for meat, and I, in a later slide, revised that. So that's not what's supposed to be up there. It's use of grains for other purpose. And obviously, one of the other purposes is to uh, feed animals, cattle, chickens, pigs, etc. But another important purpose has been as a feedstock for energy. And of course, the ethanol story is, you know, uh, a quarter, I believe, of the grain grown last year, of the corn grown last year in the United States went into ethanol. That was a huge drop in the amount of uh, corn that could be available uh, to feed people. Of course, a lot of that goes into high fructose corn syrup, which is not a good thing either. But in any case, the red arrows are the other types of uh, demand for the products of agriculture. And the brown arrows, I originally put in soil depletion, and I was feeling optimistic, so I only put one of those <laughs> brown arrows in, because I was thinking people are discovering more about how to farm in ways that don't deplete the soil. And then I suddenly remembered water. And of course, water is as critical as soil for agriculture, and the declining quantity and quality of available water is another of the tremendous challenges that we face. So, that's all my slides. Um, and I think I'll stop there. <laughs>